the thing that you learned in uh, the thing that you learned in the reading and also exercised in recitation is that when we Lorentz transform uh, these uh, this this four these four components, if we Lorentz transform these four components, uh, that is change them to a new frame, and in the new frame the vector a is going to look like this here. That vector is A. When we Lorentz transform this four vector from one to another, what we're doing is we're transforming these coordinates according to the Lorentz transformation. Of course, we've only really thought about those two coordinates. Um, and when we do that, what is conserved is the interval. So there's this there's a new conserved quantity called the interval which is what is the same about this vector here and this vector here. These are two different frames. I wrote this vector as A, and I wrote it here as A. I wrote the same vector in both places. It looks different. Why does it look different? It looks different because we're in different frames. But it is still the same four-vector displacement. It is the space-time separation between events A and B. And events A and B exist in both space-times, and the displacement between them exists in both spacetimes. So this A vector, in some sense, exists in both spacetimes. The only question is, what are its components and what is, are the conserved quantities? And what, what we learn in the interval, the interval associated, there's an interval, what's called the space-time interval, associated with A is, and we usually call it S, is C delta T squared minus delta X squared minus delta Y squared minus delta Z squared. And this is a conserved quantity when we make this Lorentz transformation. In fact, it's more important than that. This is in some sense the length or magnitude of the four vector A. Now, this is a confusing concept because if you actually calculate the length of this vector in these two diagrams by, with a ruler, if I just take a ruler, I don't have a ruler on me, but if I take a ruler and measure this vector, I'll find its different lengths on these two things. But what I will find that is if I measure the x displacement associated with the vector and the t displacement associated with the vector here and the x displacement of the, associated with the vector here and the t displacement of the vector here and make this sum of them, that quantity will be the same in both frames. So the analogy, the correct analogy to think of for normal vectors, for three vectors that we're used to using, is the length of the vector and rotations. So if you have a vector, if I draw a vector between me and this marker, and then we rotate the coordinate system, so now we look at it from a different angle. When we look at it from a different angle, this vector looks different because its angle has changed, but its length has stayed the same. So the Lorentz transformation is a kind of rotation, but it's not really a rotation because it preserves not exactly the length, but it, uh, it preserves the interval. So I shouldn't really call it the length, it is analogous to the length of A because it is the thing that is, it is preserved through this transformation. But this transformation is no longer a rotation, as I argued a week ago, and as you can clearly see in these diagrams. It is a shear. The transformation is a shear, and it preserves this thing called the interval. Okay, now I'm going to go off the deep end. So this is all, all, everything I've said right now is in some sense review, either of things that we've talked about in uh, recitation or in lecture or that you read about in the book. So now we are going to go off the deep end. I'm going to keep talking about things that are in the book, but it's going to be a very, we're going to move very fast. So kind of please, this will be in the video format because you can stop it and pull it, <coughs> pull it back and look at things again. Uh, if you need to. Uh, by the way, I should mention, somebody left this fancy Texas Instruments computer, uh, calculator in lecture. Uh, if it's yours, send the email to claim it. 
Um, okay, here we go. I'm going to erase all this because now I'm going to start talking about the physical four vector uh, of energy and momentum. And I'm not going to go over the reason, oops, the reason that the Lorentz transformation, I'm not going to go over the reason that the Lorentz transformation uh, conserves the interval, because that, of course, is very well described in the book. And furthermore, it's a very mathematical question, which is not that useful for the lecture. That's a good thing to work through in the book. So in the lecture, I want to talk about uh, uh, bigger things in some sense. Okay, so now I'm just going to postulate now a new vector. And then we're going to look at the properties of that vector. And, uh, and we're going to uh, interpret it in terms of energy momentum. So I'm going to imagine thinking about, I have a particle of mass m. And it's moving at speed v. And so from that speed v, of course, I can say, I can define beta, which is v over c, as we always do, and gamma, which is 1 over the square root of 1 minus beta squared. Okay, So v implies those two uh, constants, dimensionless constants. And now I'm going to construct, for, for this particle, I'm going to imagine, and let's imagine this is happening in the uh, speed v in the x direction. Then I'm going to make a, a four vector. I'm going to make up a four vector, which is gamma c gamma v zero zero. This particle is moving only in the x direction, so we're not going to worry about the z, the the uh, y and z components of its momentum. It has no uh, y and z components, and I've written this equation completely wrong because I forgot my masses. So let me insert my masses: gamma m c gamma m v zero zero. Now, if you remember from the first day of class, or the first week of class, this is the momentum. This is the momentum component in the x direction. This is the total momentum and the momentum in the x direction. This is a, remember the correct formula for momentum is not mv, but gamma mv, which is the way the textbook opens. And, <coughs> um, and uh, uh, we have zero momentum in the y and z direction, so this is also the momentum. So really, this, I could have written this as gamma mc px py pz. That would be, that's what I mean by this. Okay, good. And this, I said in class on Tuesday, is what's defined to be the energy of the particle. But I just stated that, and what we'll do here is, is understand that a little better. Um, but in special relativity, gamma mc becomes the energy of the particle, where this mass is, uh, is a complicated thing. It's called the rest mass, and we're going to say more about it as we go, but it has some complicated things because it takes into account uh, uh, internal degrees of freedom. So we'll see that how that works in a minute. We're going to do an inelastic collision. And you know, in when we were doing non-relativistic mechanics with non uh, with inelastic collisions, we didn't conserve the kinetic energy. We conserved energy, of course, but we saw that the kinetic energy was lost and was lost to other degrees of freedom. It had to be lost to heat or sound or other things like that. Here, this will somehow take care of that. And we'll understand that a little bit better because we'll do the relativistic generalization of the bullet and block, and uh, hopefully that will be illuminating. Uh, we'll see. Okay, now, 